Welcome back, everyone, both in the audience and online. Session two is preparation and consumption. And this session will be moderated by uh, my colleague, friend, uh, and the esteemed Professor Frank Hu, who is the chair of the Department of Nutrition and um, at the School of Public Health. And he's also a professor of medicine at the Harvard Medical School. And I don't want to take any time away from the panel. So Frank. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Imakunata. I'm so uh, delighted to participate in this really uh, stimulating and wonderful uh, symposium. Um, it's my great pleasure to moderate uh, the panel on food um, preparation and consumption. As we have already heard uh, this morning, uh, climate change has profound implications for food security, affecting food availability, accessibility, nutrition, the quality of our diets, and also global supply chains. Uh, we also note that uh, poor diets are not only major contributors to chronic diseases and premature deaths, but also to the current climate crisis. So today, um, in this panel, we will hear from three fantastic uh, speakers on uh, different aspects of uh, food preparation and consumption on the climate change. Um, our global and the local food system, uh, the restaurant industry, and uh, also uh, national uh, food policy. Um, the first speaker will be Dr. Meredith Niles. Uh, she's an associate professor um, in the Department of Nutrition and Food Sciences and was a associate director of uh, Food Systems uh, Research Center at the University of Vermont. And the second speaker, she will be um, virtual uh, from Thailand, um, Ms. Uh, Bo Sang Visavi. Uh, she's chef and also owner of the uh, Bong Nai restaurant in, in Thailand. And uh, the third speaker will be Dr. Eve Studi. Uh, she's a neat nutritionist uh, at Center for Nutrition Policy and Promotion uh, Food and Nutrition Services at US Department of uh, Agriculture. So we are very thankful that the government is not shut down. <laughs> Otherwise, she won't be here <laughs> in person. Um, so we're very excited about uh, this uh, panel. And um, uh, as in the uh, previous panel, the audience members are welcome to submit questions at any time uh, during the session. And we will get to as many as we can. So uh, without further ado, uh, Meredith, can you okay. start with your remarks? Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Hugh. It's lovely to be here with all of you. Thank you for having me. Uh, Meredith Niles, I'm an associate professor at the University of Vermont. And this session and the one after ours focuses on production, consumption, and food and water access. So I thought I would start um, by really focusing this presentation on an overview of how climate change is affecting aspects of food security and nutrition security, um, using the four elements of food security that have been mentioned a couple of times today, um, and then also sharing what I think are some strategies for potential resilience and mitigation in the food system, including some components and aspects that maybe we haven't heard about so far today. So I just want to make sure we're all on the same page when we talk about food security, but also nutrition security, which is increasingly being used. So food security is when people have access at all times to physical, social, and economic access to sufficient, safe, and nutritious food that meets their dietary needs and food preferences. That's the United Nations FAO. Um, historically, food security has focused very much on the amount of food or calories of food. And there's been a real shift more recently to talk about nutrition security, which as defined by the USDA is consistent access, availability, affordability of food and beverages that promote well-being, prevent disease, and if needed, treat disease, especially for uh, vulnerable populations, racial and ethnic minorities, lower income, and rural and remote populations. And so we've really evolved beyond just talking about food security to also talking about nutrition security very importantly. 
Now, as we've mentioned several times today, uh, food systems are obviously impacting climate change. So 34% of uh, greenhouse gas emissions globally are from the food system, predominantly from production and land use changes associated with agriculture. But also, we know that climate change is deeply affecting food systems. So this quite complex, though there are many more complex frameworks out there, really tries to demonstrate and map how different components of the food system will be impacted through a variety of climate change impacts. Um, and some of those are very direct on things like crop yields, as we often hear very much about, but they go on to affect many other components of food purchasing, food prices, debt, farmer incomes, um, even things like mental health, for example. So both mitigation and adaptation are necessary in the food system as we think about climate change. So I'm gonna talk about the impacts that we're seeing or what we're anticipated to see for how climate change is impacting all four components of food security widely utilized. So first is availability. This is the supply side of food, food production, stocks and trade. Also access, so in this country we predominantly think about economic access as being the reason why people don't have enough food or have the right kinds of food, but there are also physical and social access issues, especially in many other places. Utilization, which is food preparation, safety, cooking, and diets. And then lastly, stability, access at all times across shocks and cyclical events. So I first want to acknowledge before I get dig into some of those things that climate change is going to affect already the most vulnerable. So this graphic is showing in blue, the larger the person or the darker the person, the higher rates of food insecurity in that country, and in red, the higher rates of climate vulnerabilities. And unfortunately, there's a huge overlap between those things already. So the already most, mostly food insecure places are also those at highest risk of future climate vulnerabilities. And you can see this is predominantly focused in Sub-Saharan Africa and Asia in particular. And for many of those reasons, IFPRI, the International Food Policy Research Institute, suggests that an additional 38 million people are at risk of hunger by 2050 because of climate change, which is fully 25% more than we would have expected without climate change. So what are some of the impacts that, that we could see? Um, we heard about some of the production components this morning. But on the availability side, there are certainly impacts on yields. I'd say this is widely studied. We have a lot of research in this space. We know that climate change will largely negatively impact yields, though in northern latitudes could improve yields. Um, as we'll hear from another colleague later, it's also slated to impact seafood and fisheries viability through production impacts. There's also the increase in virulence of pests, weeds, and pathogens in cropping systems, and some evidence suggests that herbicides, for example, could be less effective under higher CO2. And it's important to recognize for animals that temperature stresses, both cold and hot, are really important impacts on things like animal weight, survival, reproduction, as well as water intake that is really critical to think through. Some of my own work has really focused on extreme events uh, in particular. And so this is data from work I did with CCAFs, the Climate Change Agriculture and Food Security Group, across 12 countries you can see at the top. And we really were able to demonstrate that households, this is uh, data from 5,000 uh, farmer households, those that experienced a climate shock were 1.7 times more likely to be food insecure. And you know, this is not unique just to other countries, lower middle income countries. And increasingly my work is actually focused in the United States because I think we pretend that somehow we will all be immune to climate change here and its food security impacts and that is most certainly not the case. Um, so work by my former PhD student Luis Rodriguez Cruz focused in Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria. And what we documented there after we surveyed farmers uh, following Maria was 69% um, of them experienced food insecurity after the hurricane, and many of them experienced persistent food insecurity, which was both an impact of the hurricane, but also of the social systems that those farmers had access to or not that really influenced um, their ability to recover. We also see extreme events can impact food access. So this graphic is showing the uh, change in imports versus exports across a variety of different regions around the world. 
and following climate-related disasters. And you can see in certain countries or regions that there are significant increases in imports um, following climate-related disasters, which can have an impact on food price, but also the cultural relevance of food or what kinds of foods might be brought in that may or may not be um, relevant to the population of those places. Um, we also see this in the economic uh, impacts of, food, of climate change. So that same uh, IFPRI report really suggested not only are food prices going to rise by 2050, but it will be double uh, what we would have otherwise expected without climate change. And importantly, as I mentioned earlier, there are social considerations to food access as well. Um, so we know that women and marginalized groups are already often um, unable to access food in the same ways. That could be exacerbated through climate change. We also know, as I think we'll hear on the next panel, there are real challenges with water scarcity and who has access to those resources. And we're already seeing climate-induced migrations, which can deeply impact food access, where people wind up and also where they leave. An area that I don't think we hear enough about uh, in this space is, is utilization and food safety. And so there are huge food safety implications from climate change that we don't think very much about. This is a picture from Vermont, uh, where, where I live from Burlington. That's the flood water line in the Inner Vale, which is a huge garden um, and farming community in Burlington, five feet of flood waters. And unfortunately, there's a huge increase in pathogens and disease that can happen with extreme events as well as contaminants uh, from uh, some of these impacts. So anytime floodwaters touch agricultural production in the United States, the Food and Drug Administration rules that to be contaminated, and those crops can no longer be harvested. So that has real implications for a lot of farmers in Vermont right now who are trying to figure out how to feed their cows in the fall and the winter when they lost their entire corn crop, for example. Um, also, this has impacts on food loss and spoilage. We heard a little bit about the cold chain refrigeration, but of course, with warming temperatures, we could also expect to see changes in um, how food loss happens and occurs, and also warmer temperatures could exacerbate spoilage as well. Um, I also wanted to mention on the utilization side, this is not my work, but there's been some interesting growth and in work um, here at Harvard and at other places as well, looking at actually how the micronutrient, protein, and vitamin content of foods could also change as a result of being grown under high CO2 conditions. Um, and this particular paper here looked in rice and found some major changes that could occur under higher CO2 concentrations. Um, which may not be a huge deal if you have a very diverse diet, like many of us do in high-income countries, but in places where rice is the predominant food, these shifts could be really catastrophic. Um, and in terms of dietary diversity, some of our work from my lab has also looked at how dietary diversity has shifted as a result of climate change. So the map at the bottom here shows the average dietary diversity from uh, over 100,000 children in 19 different countries. On average, those children are eating about three foods per day in a 24-hour dietary recall. So if one of those food groups is rice and it loses 20% of its protein, that's quite significant. Um, but we also found in this study that those dietary diversity changes were more highly correlated with temperature extremes um, than even, for example, the impact of being poor in your community. So I just wanted to end with four things that I think are important for the conversation as we think about resilience and mitigation in this space. Um, and I hope these are complementary to some of the other strategies that we've talked about today. So first of all, um, there's been a focus on a variety of agricultural approaches, but I think it's critical that we also think about focusing on practices in agriculture that have co-benefits, those that are both for adaptation and mitigation. Um, and these are often less adopted, uh, widely speaking. So this is a graphic from a study um, that we did um, in partnership with the Climate Change Agriculture and Food Security Group where we had data from 800 smallholder farmers uh, over 10 years to look at how uh, likely they had been to implement a variety of different practices. And they've implemented a, a variety of changes for sure, um, but certain practices that might have both mitigation and adaptation co-benefits like cover crop adoption or mulching or hedges, for example, are very lowly adopted. And this is actually mirrored here even in the United States where the cover crop adoption rate, for example, is below 10%. 
Um, at the same time, I'd like to make a plea that we also move beyond just talking about the agriculture pathways and assumptions um, that this is the way in which we have to focus on food security or nutrition security. Um, and I mean that in the sense that I think it's really important that we recognize that just increasing production does not necessarily increase food or nutrition security. And there are so many other complex challenges around distribution and access and utilization that we also need to pay attention to. Um, and there's some evidence to suggest that these multi-sectoral approaches that go beyond just agriculture but also work with nutritionists and extension, for example, are very effective, as are really, quite honestly, direct cash transfers to people after they face a disaster. Um, the third thing I wanted to note before I wrap up is also I think it's critical we talk about social networks and cultural factors in this conversation. So some of my own work has even found that um, households that are part of group memberships are more likely to be food secure, and also that communities that had more social capital following Hurricane Irene in Vermont were much more able to overcome food insecurity challenges. And then lastly, I thought I'd say something about the consumption and mitigation side of um, people often talk about diets. So yes, I think dietary shifts are critical to this conversation, but we have to have some nuance when we have these conversations, I think. Um, so first, I think we need to recognize the, where the biggest impacts are. Um, a recent study found that 12% of Americans ate half of US meat. Um, that came out just a couple of months ago. And I want to acknowledge that a billion people globally rely on livelihoods from livestock, and we cannot just take those livelihoods away from people in, a, in an attempt to eat less meat. And lastly, uh, we have to maybe have some moderation here because a lot of studies suggest that people are willing to change their diets up to a point, but beyond a 40% shift, uh, maybe people aren't so happy about that. So that's all I have for now. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here and look forward to the conversation. Thank you, uh, Meredith. Uh, next, we're going to play a, a recorded video by uh, Bo. Hi, I'm Bo from Bolan, Bangkok, Thailand. And today, I come here to talk about sustainability and climate change with you guys. Who and what actually make the climate change happen? Who make our food system become unsustainable? I believe you're right. It is us, lovely human beings, who love to eat and also who value our cooking skill, our unique skill in cooking that none of any animals in the world can do. We love to produce to the max, we love to consume to the max, but every single part of the food system today, the modern food system today, actually contributing to the climate change on the understanding that we need to adapt because i read so many articles i watched so many videos about the climate change and a lot of them the expert asks us to adapt to the climate change it's almost like they ask me to accept it well as much as i have to accept the climate change but I feel like we can do something about it. So there's three points that I want to raise here. The first point is the innovations, the advanced technologies that we are really good at as a human being. We're really good at coming up with the new things. But the new things, the new knowledge, should it go hand in hand with our mother nature? Should it be a lot more gentle to our mother nature and not try to win or not to go against? <laughs> Like we are trying too hard to win our mother nature's and we learn that we can't. And so the new technologies, the new innovations toward our food system should be gentle, be part of the mother nature's. My second point, which I really emphasize everywhere I go, is food education. Food literacy. We know the impact of our food choice. We need to have that education everywhere in the world. I mean everywhere in the world. At a really young age would be lovely, but it has to be every age, even for the grow up as well. Because if we understand the impact of our food choice, what we put in our mouth, how it impact our health, how it impact other people's health, and also how it impact the environmental health, if we have that knowledge, we understand it. 
I believe we can make a better choice and it will be better for our climate change situation right now. It might slow it down, it might reverse it, it might stop it, who knows. But food education is really needed everywhere in the world because I have a total belief that uh, food education, knowledge, understanding together with the proper judgment will make us sustainable in the food world. The final point is waste produced from food. Waste at every stage of food production and food consumption contribute to the climate change. So knowing where and how our food is produced is really important and as important as knows where and how our food and food packaging ends up as well. At Bolan, in our daily operations, we have a goal of zero food waste to landfill. So we truly try to use and utilize our food fully. That is from nose to tails concepts to fruit to leaf concepts. For example, with our lemon glass scrap, we turn it into our welcome drinks. And with that welcome drinks, we use every part of our lemon glass, as well as the leftover rice for the service. We turn it into a lovely pretty food called smoked rice biscuit, and we serve it with the toasted rice tea as well. When it's not appropriate for human consumption, we try to make it available for animals. So we dry our seafood scraps and then pass it on to our chicken farmers. And as well as uh, we uh, ferment our leftover coconut meat and then give it to uh, our pig farmers because it's made a really great pig feed that hides in probiotics. If our food cannot be consumed, then we will look looking at how we can upcycle it. And we implement a lot of different uh, upcycling cross programs within the restaurant, uh, from extracting the pectins and the essential oils from the citrus peel, and then we use it in our cleaning products. We also dry the eggs, chill, and then we turn it into the powders and we use it in our garden, and it's a great pest deterrent as well. Our fruit peels get macerated in leftovers, desserts, and or sugar for several days, and it makes potent EMO effective microorganisms that we can dilute and use in the farms, or we can pour down the drains to clean our drainage as, as well. It is important to look at waste it from the kitchens, more than just the food waste per se. We actually collect our empty squad bottles that can't be recycled in Thailand and work with a local glass blower and turn them into beautiful jugs. We turn our used oil, spent oil into soap and use it as a cleaning materials within our kitchens. Unfortunately, we still use plastic kai backpack from time to time and when we use them, we clean them and then we work with a local scrap lab from the universities and turn them into aprons and bags and so many beautiful artist stuff. Finally, any food scrap that cannot be upcycling or used along with the plate waste, they all get composed on site at the restaurant. As a chef, I work closely with seasonalities, uh, fruit, vegetables from Thailand. But not only that, because in Thailand, we actually have seasonalities for seafood as well. Through the years that I've been working in the restaurant, I see the shade and ship of the times that thing bears. Sometimes, you know, in April, I might have this fruit, and in November, that fruit should come in already for my farmers, but it never comes. And then I ring them, so I ask them, what happened to my fruit? And my answer, or their answer more like, is like, oh, this year, you know, it's really hot. So and it's, we have a long, dry, hot summers, or some year it's like, oh, this year is really cold. We never get this cold in Thailand before. Sometimes the answers go through like, oh, it's rained too much. So all the flower, the buds that are gonna bear fruit have been fallen down before uh, the right times or sometimes the rain never comes. So I see the extreme of this change, the shift of the times more and more every year. So it's just really come to my surprise when someone tell me that I don't believe in climate change Be because simply I don't want a scientific evidence. It's clear, it's in front of me already and it happens every year. 
And even though I am really, really worried about the food availabilities, that how we're gonna feed the world with the climate change and things like that, I'm more worried about the culinary heritage and wisdom that we used to have. You know, the seasonalities has been long distorted um, long times ago. Thanks to the innovations, thanks to the advanced agricultural technologies that make things available all year round. And the climate change come along and make me confused even more and it's made my heart, uh, it's made my life actually harder and more challenging as a chef because I can't plan my menu properly. But that's not about that only. That's only the small part. But because of the culinary wisdom and the culinary knowledge in Thailand, in my part of the world, it's actually go hand in hand with our traditional medicinal knowledge. For us, it is really important of what to eat when. And when the climate change, the time shift, it mix everything up. For me to be able to pass on the culinary heritage together with the knowledge of the optimum health and to be able to continue enjoying the food that given by the modern natures, really yummy, really delicious and really nutrient dense. It is our responsibilities to taking care of the nature. And it doesn't matter what your occupations it doesn't matter where are you from. It doesn't matter how old are you. You're part of the solutions towards sustainability and you're part of the solutions towards climate change. It is our responsibilities all together to make the world better, to make sure we have enough food for everybody and to make sure that we can continue to enjoy our food. Thank you for listening. Hey, th thank you, Bo. She's, uh, she will uh, join us virtually in the panel discussion uh, later. So next, Eve. Hi, it's really a pleasure to be here with all of you today to talk about the dietary guidelines for Americans. So I'm going to begin just with a little bit of background. Um, what are the dietary guidelines? Um, how do we develop them? And what, what kind of grounds our development of the dietary guidelines? So the dietary guidelines are mandated by law by the National Nutrition Monitoring and Related Research Act of 1990. That act mandates that the dietary guidelines shall contain nutritional and dietary information and guidelines for the general public that it be published jointly by the Secretaries of Agriculture and Health and Human Services at least every five years, that it be based on the preponderance of scientific and medical knowledge, which is current at the time, and that the guidelines shall be promoted by each federal agency in carrying out any federal food, nutrition, or health program. The first edition of the Dietary Guidelines was released in 1980. They've been released every five years since then. The latest edition was released in December of 2020. We are working on the next edition, uh, which we plan to release in 2025. The Dietary Guidelines provide food-based advice. Um, so for example, what you can see on the left-hand side of the screen um, is a sample eating pattern. So there's recommendations for the amounts of uh, different food groups and subgroups that should be eaten daily, weekly, over time to promote health and prevent diet-related chronic diseases. I do wanna note just a couple of things. First, that the Dietary Guidelines is it's a guide. It's intended to be a framework um, that can be tailored and adapted based on personal preferences, uh, vegetarian consideration, cultural traditions, and more. So this is an example um, of an 1800 calorie pattern that you see on the left, but there's also, of course, um, vegetarian variations and other variations of this pattern. 
Now this food-based advice is intended to help meet nutrient needs. So there's uh, recommendations for nutrients, of course, like uh, calcium or iron. So the dietary guidelines are designed, a, a package of foods that's designed to meet those individual nutrient needs. And of course, we're also in a, in a state where we have six in 10 adults who are experiencing one or more diet-related chronic condition. And the major outcomes that are considered in thinking about um, the dietary guidelines are designed to promote health and help prevent diet-related chronic diseases. And those diseases and conditions that are the focus are those that are greatest public health concern. And so uh, the latest additions have really focused on overweight and obesity, cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, diet-related cancer, as well as neurocognitive health, bone health, all-cause mortality, and pregnancy and infant outcomes. So I thought I'd talk a little bit about how we go about developing that national food policy. Um, this, as I mentioned, we are required by law to release the dietary guidelines at least every five years, and it's a multi-step, multi-year process. And essentially, when we release the one edition, we're very closely on the tails of that working to develop the next edition. So that process is outlined on this slide. And the first step, we're really trying to identify what are those topic areas or questions that are of particular uh, public health importance at the time. Um, and so for example, so we're identifying topics and questions. And as an example for the current edition, there's focused around um, diets with varying amounts of ultra processed foods and risk of obesity. So there's a, a discussion around what are those top areas of interest that it should inform this guidance. In the second step, USDA and HHS appoint an external scientific advisory committee who conducts that review of evidence that is done in the third step. So in that third step, there is a review of the scientific evidence by our external scientific advisory committee. And that helps us to get to, as I mentioned in the mandate, the guidelines are to reflect the preponderance of current uh, medical and um, scientific information at the time. The way that recent advisory committees have examined the evidence is through systematic reviews, and that's peer reviewed, systematic reviews of peer reviewed literature, uh, primarily of uh, randomized control trials and prospective cohort studies, analysis of federal data sets, as well as an analysis called food pattern modeling that really uh, looks at a package of foods and understands like shifts in food groups and subgroups, how that might impact meeting nutrient needs. So the work of the advisory committee concludes when they develop a scientific report. That scientific report outlines their scientific review and provides advice to USDA and HHS for the next edition of the dietary guidelines. In the fourth step, USDA and HHS, the federal agencies, develop the dietary guidelines. As I mentioned, the dietary guidelines are created um, every five years, and so they're starting from the previous edition. So there is that foundation, and it's intended to evolve and grow. The, however, revisions to that guidance is informed by the committee's scientific review, as well as input from other federal agencies and public comments. So in the final step then, those dietary guidelines are implemented through federal programs, and I'll talk, give some examples of that in just a minute, as well as by uh, health professionals. And as I mentioned, we're in the process for developing the 2025 edition of the Dietary Guidelines. We're currently in step three of that process where our advisory committee is reviewing scientific evidence, while we are also concurrently working to promote um, the current edition, which is, um, so we're in step five for the 2020 edition. So just as nutrition science has evolved over time, so have the dietary guidelines for Americans. So I'll just note early editions in, in 1980 and 1985, they really focused on nutrients. So um, there was discussion around eating enough starch or fiber or in, in not too much fat. Um, editions then evolved so that there was more discussion on the food-based guidance. People eat food, um, not the nutrients, and so there was more discussion around food. And I'll note just a couple of, um, I'll just say that core guidance overall, recommendations for vegetables, fruits, whole grains, that has remained relatively consistent over time, but there's re been some refinements. So on the left-hand side of the screen, you see the 2015 edition of the Dietary Guidelines, and actually Dr. Frank Hu was a member of our respective advisory committee for that work. And that was the first edition that really spent a lot of focus on uh, dietary patterns. So not thinking about the individual um, nutrients or food groups, but how that package of food is eaten collectively 
over time and that, that impact of that pattern of consumption and health. So that was a really important kind of evolution in our guidance. The center edition is the current edition, the 2020 edition of the Dietary Guidelines, and that edition had a focus on nutrition across the lifespan. Um, the Dietary Guidelines have traditionally focused on individuals two years and older, and there was a really a, a huge um, call for guidance to also include from birth through 23 months of age. And so a big focus of the committee's work and the federal government's work was around developing guidance for infants and toddlers. Um, and in that process also focused on identifying special considerations for children, adolescents, adults, older adults, and individuals during pregnancy and lactation. So a life stage focus in promoting health, you know, it's never too early or too late too late to move towards a healthy diet was the focus of the, is the focus of the current edition. Now, as I mentioned, the 2025 Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee is underway now. So what their focus is really um, around the health equity lens. And Dr. Sarah Bleich, who's here, was really instrumental in helping to inform that kind of overall um, scope. And their work is really looking at um, equitable representation within the dietary guidelines. So representing the broad variety of foods um, and beverages that we see consumed in the U.S. Now, the focus of this is, of course, around the consumption piece um, of this panel, and I do want to spend just a minute talking about current consumption. So we have a tool um, called the Healthy Eating Index that assesses how well a diet aligns with the recommendations in the dietary guidelines, so recommendations for vegetables, fruits, whole grains, and more. That has a score of 0 to 100, with 100 being greater alliance, al alignment. On average in the U.S., the score is a 58, and there is a lot of room a lot of room for improvement, and we see that that score has not improved over time. We also see that our youngest and oldest people in the U.S. typically have higher scores, but still that's far from um, what we would call a healthy diet. And a particular concern is the constellation of poor nutrition that we see among adolescents. So as I mentioned, um, the dietary guidelines are mandated to be re reflected in federal programs and policies, and often that's kind of an abstract thing, so we, I wanted to just give a couple of examples of that in action. Um, so for example, the Dietary Guidelines, the 2015 edition, had recommendations around limiting the amount of added sugars that should be consumed to less than 10% per day. So how has that impact been implemented kind of within federal policies and programs? Um, in one way is the addition of added sugars to the Nutrition Facts Panel. Uh, so FDA added added sugars in large part in response to the dietary guidelines, and that has allowed us to be able to identify, to monitor, um, and for people to inform decisions around foods and beverages and the amount of added sugars they contain. Another example is through recent uh, proposed meal standards that USDA have put out for um, school meals. And they have proposed a two-phase approach um, to kind of implementing the dietary guidelines um, for added sugars. In the first, there is a recommendation around adding limits to different products. So reducing the amount of added sugars or to a certain limit. So for example, for uh, flavored milks or for breakfast cereals. In the first, or that's the first phase, and then in the second phase, they are actually looking to, over the course of a week, no more than 10% of uh, calories can come from added sugars in school meals. So both of these could have great impact on the current nutrition, child nutrition, um, where we see high intakes of added sugars in children, and also those product limits could actually have an impact on the food supply. Of course, the focus of this symposium is around uh, food sustainability and climate change. So I did want to spend some time uh, speaking about that in relation to the dietary guidelines. The 2010 edition of the dietary guidelines stated that it was important to develop and expand safe, effective, and sustainable agriculture and aquaculture practices to ensure availability of recommended amounts of healthy foods to all segments of the population. The 2015 Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee did include sustainability outcomes in four of the 83 scientific questions that they examined. However, the dietary guidelines themselves have continued to focus on uh, meeting nutrient needs, promoting human health, and preventing diet-related chronic diseases. 
Um, that said, there are a lot of activities within USDA and HHS related to food sustainability and climate change. Um, just related to some of the discussion today, food security is of extreme importance, nutrition security. Again, Dr. Sarah Bleich um, came to USDA to support efforts around nutrition security, uh, food waste, there's a lot of activities there as well as other related topics. Um, just quickly as I wrap up, I wanna note that there are two activities um, of just to highlight here. One is a project that's being um, supported by the National Institutes of Health called Advantage that is looking at the intersection of food systems, diet, nutrition, and health in a changing environment. And we, there is another activity that is being supported by USDA and HHS where we've convened a federal work group to look at uh, ways to, various ways to consider integrating sustainability into future editions of the dietary guidelines. That work group has actually just been formed. There will be public meetings around that. And if there is interest in that or this NIH activity, you can go to dietaryguidelines.gov and we have a related projects page and we'll be updating that as that work continues. So with that, again, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here and look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, uh, all three of you, for fantastic opening remarks. Uh, for the moderate um, panel discussion, let me start with a question for Meredith. Um, so you talk about both global food system and the local food system. Of course, global and the local food systems are intertwined. Typically, international organizations like uh, UN uh, propose global targets for improving food sustainability. And then uh, those um, proposals or recommendations are implemented at local level. Of course, there are a lot of uh, um, specific cultural, social, and uh, economical uh, situations uh, in local uh, when you Im implement those policies or recommendations at local level. So uh, one example is the uh, Eat Lancet report. Uh, as you know, uh, three years ago, uh, the Lancet Commission uh, published a landmark report which um, recommend the planetary health diet to reduce uh, uh, climate uh, impact of our food system. Uh, but this, uh, those recommendations have to be uh, implemented at local levels. Mm -hmm. So just want to hear your thoughts, how those kind of global targets uh, or global recommendations can be implemented in, at local level, like in Vermont mm -hmm. or in Bangladesh or in Kenya. So what's your thoughts, how those kind of global uh, recommendations can be imp implemented? Sure, yeah, thank you so much for that question, Dr. Hugh. Um, I, think, I think that's an interesting one to think about um, and also to reflect on the extent to which those global reports are or can be implemented um, in the multiple pathways. I think there's a, a few pathways there. Um, first, I think it's also really important, I understand the Eat Lancet report is also evolving to have more regionally and culturally relevant recommendations, um, recognizing that implementation of a single diet globally is, uh, is not realistic and also ignores a variety of cultural factors, as you noted. Um, I think, you know, Eve's work actually gives a good example of, of some of the pathways. So here domestically, the Dietary Guidelines for Americans, um, often people, my own students, like, don't even understand why do we have them sometimes. Sorry, Eve. Um, you'll have to come talk in my class. Uh, but because they don't think anyone follows them, but they actually guide all of federal uh, food policy, right? So they guide the National School Lunch Program, which feeds a huge number of children in this country. They also guide what happens in uh, our, our prison system, for example, around food. So I think uh, countries have uh, dietary recommendations. That is one pathway to consider things like the Eat Lancet. Um, and there was a report a few years ago that came out, um, Planet's pyramids and plates, I think, that actually looked at the extent to which sustainability was being incorporated into dietary guidelines. Only a few countries um, have been doing that, but I do think that is a pathway. Um, but I also think we have to have uh, a nuanced conversation, as I, I sort of made a plea for, around what are the pathways for how we help people think through their dietary choices. 
And we also have to recognize uh, most of my work being with rural poor people, um, they don't have choices. Um, and so I think there is a conversation here today, especially at a place like Harvard, where most of us in this room probably have the ability to look at the Eat Lancet report and implement those changes in our own diets or our household if we would like, but a lot of people don't have those options. And so I think we have to couple conversations around dietary choice uh, or dietary preferences with also conversations around living wages and other factors that deeply impact what people eat and what they can afford. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Bo, uh, I really admire your, uh, can you hear me? I, I really yes. admire your uh, heroic efforts to reduce food waste to zero in, in, in your restaurants. That's just uh, uh, incredible. So one question I have, uh, how much does it cost to reduce uh, the food waste to zero? Because you, you show some pictures converting the food waste to handbags. And I don't know whether what, what kind of cost it will uh, entail when you, um, I mean, basically cut uh, food waste to zero. Right. Well, when we looking at the implementing the upcycling programs, our principles in doing that is we try to use the low cost technologies and hopefully we don't have to buy a lot of different things. Um, so like when we do the EM, what we have to purchase is just like couple of um, plastic bucket to do the fruit EM with and we buy 14 of them for seven days. So two buckets a day only, and then we use it in a cycle of a week. Um, like the plastic bag things that we make from the high bag bag, we only need an iron and a wax paper. So a lot of things, all the soap making things that we make at the restaurants, we don't, we need to, we just use a hand blender or we uh, adapt or improvise what we have as a kitchen equipment already so we don't have to spend too much money on the new things. The only thing that, that I really, really spend my money is actually the post loop composter. Just because uh, we are right in the middle of Bangkok, and I um, try to do the open pile, and then I have a massive rat run across the garden, just because mm -hmm. they have access to food. So that like the only things that I really have to invest in and make sure that all the food waste is like uh, within the proper composter or the urban setting. Thank yeah, you. but it's um, actually the money in the long run. Yeah, I think this is certainly a very important issue because if you want to scale up uh, your efforts uh, across uh, the country and uh, in other countries, certainly the cost uh, issue is important. But uh, yeah, thank you. And Yves, um, must say that I had a tremendous pleasure working with you uh, almost 10 years ago. Uh, on the 2015 Dietary Guidelines for Americans uh, Scientific Advisory Committee. And uh, benefit, we benefited tremendously from your uh, expertise, especially uh, reviewing a uh, vast amount of uh, literature on diet and, and health. So um, one question I have is regarding how uh, the dietary guidelines and uh, environmental sustainability can be integrated uh, together because you may know that uh, uh, many countries, especially in Europe and also our neighbor, Canada, uh, they have already included environmental sustainability in their dietary, national dietary guidelines, uh, recognizing the uh, interconnectedness of our diet, health outcomes, and, and the environment. And you mentioned several initiatives at the USDA that looking at environmental sustainability kind of separately from uh, health. Um, so I was wondering whether it is possible to kind of integrate them together, so make the dietary guidelines more powerful and perhaps more persuasive, especially for younger generations. So as I mentioned, there is an activity going on right now to look at just that, how can we integrate them and what might that look like? Um, is it, at the same time, at, you know, like as we're working, is it a, 
is it a committee that expands to include this expertise? Mm -hmm. Is it a parallel process that it feeds into? Like there's some work at WHO where it kind of feeds in a little bit later. So I think the pathway is one part of it. I think a big reality is another piece that has come up a bit. It's Currently, people are not meeting the dietary guidelines, even as they are. Um, we don't meet recommendations for vegetables, fruits, whole grains. We do need to shift consumption. So whether that's the communications around a rationale, and in the work that you did um, with the 2015 advisory committee, looked at dietary patterns and different sustainability outcomes and generally found that shifting from current consumption towards a diet that more aligns with the dietary guidelines has benefits beyond just human health. So it is, I think, obviously this is an, uh, an important and urgent conversation. In general, shifting consumption away from where what our average American consumption is to a healthier pattern could have benefits too. So I think it's not just the dietary guidelines, it's additional conversations and to me most importantly, how do, what do we do and how, how can we help move that needle to improve uh, current nutrition? And I think you're right that this is a really important uh, discussion, particularly for our younger generations as a mm -hmm. um, impetus or as a rationale that I think will resonate there. Right, yeah, thank you. Uh, my next question I think is relevant to all three of you. Uh, so Meredith, as you mentioned, uh, our food system contributes to roughly 30% of greenhouse gas emissions, and then the livestock sector accounts for almost half of it. So what can we do with the, about the livestock sector to reduce greenhouse uh, emissions and to improve overall environmental sustainability? So we're talking about production, talking about consumption, and also talking about uh, national dietary guidelines. So perhaps I start with you in terms of uh, uh, production. Sure. Well, I do think it's interesting in that graphic that I showed where it shows that production is, you know, a huge portion of the total amount of food systems emissions as if production exists without demand and consumption. Um, so those things are related. Um, the other half of my work is actually working with farmers to help farmers implement more sustainable management practices. And um, there's a lot that can happen in that space. I have a, a large project right now with U.S. dairy farmers focused on climate mitigation and adaptation. Um, so there's a number of things that can happen on the production side to reduce emissions. Some of that is on feeding strategies. So the kinds of forage quality that animals have can influence their methane emissions. Um, also, there's a lot of manure management strategies, so how we manage manure and how we compost it, how we can separate it, recycle it within closed loop systems. The majority of those emissions are enteric, though, meaning that they are the result of the digestive process of ruminant animals. Um, and so that is where there's been a lot of conversations, one, around feeding strategies um, that can actually improve uh, digestibility of forages for animals, for example, but also then shifting away from certain kinds of products. Um, so I do think it's important in the consumption conversation that we are uh, distinct about the kinds of animal products we're talking about when we talk about climate change. Uh, they're not all created equally. So ruminant animals like cattle, sheep, uh, for example, have much higher enteric emissions than, say, poultry or pigs um, or seafood, for example, although there's a lot of complexities there that I'm sure we'll hear about in the next panel. So as we're talking about dietary shifts for climate change, there is some nuance in that conversation around what kind of meat people might shift towards or replace. I also think it's really important there's some um, companies out there who, who aren't just doing the whole replacement, right? That they're not just saying, sub your burger for a mushroom burger, let's instead substitute 40% of the meat in the burger with mushrooms hmm. and give people an option that still has some meat but also has you know, some mushrooms in it. So I think we have to think across all of those strategies um, as we consider this issue, ranging from how we actually raise animals and what kinds of uh, systems, uh, what we feed them, um, and also how we manage their manure um, as well. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Uh, Bo, um, as you probably know, when people get richer, get wealthier, they want to eat more animal protein, more meat. I think this has happened in uh, uh, many uh, Asian countries, in Thailand, in China, um, and in, in other uh, economically uh, developing countries. 
So um, what's your experience in terms of consumers' attitude toward uh, eating meat um, or versus eating more plant-based foods? Because traditionally, uh, Thai cuisine and other Asian cuisines are very rich in plant-based foods, plant-based proteins, but nowadays people want more animal products. So what, what's your uh, experience uh, about consumer attitudes and the behaviors? Yeah, obviously they really want to eat um, more and more meat proteins from different sorts. Uh, in Thailand especially, there is um, um, rights of eating beef. And beef used to be hard to come by and it's not really, really part of Thai diet. But today they eat like way too much um, beef. However, there is another um, size of the society as well that um, also pro plant based. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, well, as uh, me as a chef, I promote things like sustainable meat and moderate consumptions, and that's what mm -hmm. I try to tell the people in Thailand as well. Yeah, do you, uh, in your menus, do you have uh, plant-based meat alternatives or, or even cultured meat? Would, would you be uh, interested in serving uh, like cell-based meat or cultured meat? Um, for me, I'm a naturalist and I'm on the natural side, so I'll I, I serve real food plant-based. So I'm not oh, going to serve food and mm -hmm. this type of thing and mm -hmm. hopefully if there is something come ar come along like with mm -hmm. organics or like a sustainable mm -hmm. because i don't feel like that is sustainable either the mm -hmm. the plant-based meat or like the synthesis meat that make from so um demo soybeans mm -hmm. yeah okay yeah thank you um eve in terms of uh, dietary guidelines uh, uh in terms of promoting uh, more plant-based foods or plant-rich dietary patterns. We're not talking about everyone become vegetarians or vegans, We're talking about less meat, more plant-based foods. So what kind of role uh, the government have in terms of promoting this kind of uh, healthy eating patterns which are beneficial for both human health and the planetary health? I think especially the role of dietary guidelines in this regard. I wish we had more of a role and more of an opportunity. Um, we are up against a very big food supply, or a very big food industry, and a very complex food supply. So um, I would say I wish we had more resources to be more out there. Um, our consumer tool is MyPlate, and there is a lot of work to um, make MyPlate a household name. Um, and to show variability in how you can eat a healthy diet, no matter what your plate looks like, um, your cultural preferences, your budget. I will also say um, we've had, so plant-based, um, mm -hmm. our 2010 dietary guidelines had a fair amount of discussion around promoting plant-based diets, and we did some consumer testing around that terminology, and there was a lot of confusion and so it's been a tricky, you know, I think you're right. It's, I mean, the dietary guidelines are plant-based. They are largely, pro, you know, if you look at the plate, most of the plate is plant-based. So, but that is a very difficult term to communicate. So part of that could be around the communications pieces, um, but it is, there's, there's a lot of complexity there. There's competing against the foods, uh, food industry, the food mm -hmm. supply. Well, yeah, that's someone, uh, some people have said that uh, maybe USDA is uh, conflicted because it has, of course, oversee uh, and help uh, a massive uh, livestock sector in the US. Uh, and um, uh, in many states, of course, beef is uh, major for the industry. So the question is how the dietary guidelines can navigate this kind of uh, uh, potential uh, conflicts on the one hand, you want to improve health of the uh, population, the planet. On the other hand, of course, you also want to um, cater to the interests of the, um, the, the, farm, the beef farmers. Um, so 
and, and then this is a politically charged question, but this is, I, I think, uh, uh, um, kind of dilemma uh, um, the dietary guidelines um, kind of facing. So I'm glad you asked it. Um, so I've been with USDA for almost 15 years and worked on um, the dietary guidelines. Prior to that, I worked at Department of Health and Human Services working on the dietary guidelines. And my experience has been our office is pretty isolated. Mm -hmm. And working with our advisory committee is, like that scientific report is extremely important in our process. And if we have the scientific evidence, and we have been very um, protected. It, it's around, every experience I have had is that looking at the scientific evidence, that's what informs the guidance. And so we have, we have been protected. USDA is huge. Um, but we, have, we do not interact with those other components of the agency. So it's a, I, it's a totally fair question, um, but seeing it act out, um, we have been able to be isolated, essentially a, like a policy shop that works on the guidance um, and develops that guidance. So I, appreciate, I understand that um, concern, but we haven't seen it play out. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, now we uh, move on to um, some questions from the uh, audience. We get a lot of questions uh, right now. Um, maybe I'll start with you, Meredith. So you talk about um, the climate change has huge impact on the nutrient contents of crops, uh, rice, um, um, grains, um, and, and, and even um, uh, the vegetable oils. Um, so one issue is that, uh, uh, as you know, during COVID, there is a, a huge uh, increase, a big surge in food insecurity. And people who are um, nutritionally insecure, they are more susceptible to COVID. And so the question is, what can um, farmers or the government do to preserve the nutrition quality of the crops that can be uh, enhance the uh, individual immune system, not just to reduce the risk of uh, infection disease, but also reduce risk of uh, chronic disease. So what's kind of, uh, here I'm talking about the intersections between food insecurity, infectious disease, and the chronic disease. What, 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 how, how to put this in the context of uh, food policies? Yeah, well, that's a big question. Um, okay, well, I'll stick within my expertise, not being a plant breeder or anything like that. Um, I mean, first of all, I think it's important to acknowledge that there is a strong link between food insecurity and chronic disease prevalence. Um, we see that very clearly. And a lot of my work domestically has focused actually on the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on food insecurity and the longer term health impacts that we're seeing as a result of changes in food insecurity domestically here in the United States for largely um, uh, people of low income. So there's a huge connection between food insecurity and chronic health outcomes. Um, that is related to things like cardiometabolic disease, but also mental health. There are much significant higher levels of anxiety and depression, for example, among food insecure households. That also has impacts on children, um, if children are in a household that's food insecure. So this connection is very relevant, um, how we think about food insecurity and its link to chronic disease. Um, that being said, I mean, I think as we think about how climate change could impact food security and also the nutrient contents of foods, there's probably a natural inclination for people to go towards like biofortification. We should just biofortify everything and that's the solution. Um, I think that's one of the tools, you know, in the toolbox and there are others um, in plant breeding who might be able to speak to that more. But I think we also have to acknowledge what the starting place is for a lot of rural poor. Um, as I noted in my presentation, the average child five and under in the study that we did of 100,000 children ate three food groups per day, right? So I think we also need to just think about diversification of diets um, in addition to just sort of like a narrow focus, 
a narrow focus on biofortification, for example. To me, that is, um, that is both an agricultural problem, right? We need to be growing a diversity of foods in a given place or provide market access through income, livable wages for people to purchase foods. Um, but it also has to do with distribution and supply chains and the complexity of moving fruits and vegetables around, as we heard from our, our previous um, uh, colleague as well. So to me, I think we have to have a systems way that we look at these issues. I think just focusing on a single solution when we have a systematic problem that is deeply linked to other outcomes like chronic disease or metabolic issues um, is not going to be a surefire solution. So in that sense, I think we need, um, we need more investment in agriculture, as we heard from some of our early panelists, um, but we also need to, to have people that are working across these different systems, right? Mm -hmm. So actually, I think the dietary guidelines are a really interesting example where you have two federal agencies that work on something mm -hmm. jointly related to, um, to nutrition. We could think about something like that happening in a food systems context, right? Where we would bring together not just HHS and USDA, but so many other federal agencies like transportation who also um, you know, should be thinking about food systems and, and food transportation. So to me, I, just, uh, I teach in a food systems program, and I think systems thinking is really critical as we try to tackle some of these issues. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, thank you. Uh, Bo, uh, you um, talk about the importance of uh, improving food literacy. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's a, that's a really important issue. I mean, I think even in uh, economically developed countries in the US, I think in general, food lit literacy is, is quite low, and a lot of people think they're nutrition experts because they eat, <laughs> not because they actually know the nutrition uh, facts. So what do you do, what, what, what uh, Thailand do to improve the uh, food literacy of the population, especially children? Right. Um, in Thailand, we have like a couple of different NGO groups who are working on the, um, giving the food education to different levels of um, kids in school. So we have like the one organization leading by um, the ladies called Anne, who go into the school, teach the teachers how to cook for a lunch for the kids, and at the same time, um, He's also used the native local ingredients and then presented to both the school teachers and the kids at the same time. And there is another um, organization called uh, Food for Change, or um, yeah, it's called Food for Change Thailand. And these organizations, they um, have a lot of materials who give out to different schools. and also to the university as well. So like the educator providers can also use their materials and they, we try to run workshops like food educations, like testings of different things, comparing the natural things to the artificial things. Or oh, yeah, a lot of fruits that people doesn't eat anymore mm. Mm. because it's not trendy so fat or fashionable. We bring it back to the school and then we make make sure that they have a chance to try it and understand where the food comes from and also where mm -hmm. do the waste of food waste go as well. Yeah, do you have teaching kitchens in schools, for example, to improving uh, cooking skills of uh, young people? I actually campaigning for that. Like I want to mm -hmm. put, uh, I want to go to the Ministry of Education and make it a, pro a compulsory program for mm. food education in school. Mm. That's, yeah, that's wonderful. Um, you, so you talk about um, for the 2025 um, dietary guidelines, um, uh, there is uh, effort right and, and a way to incorporate um, uh, uh, nutrition disparities uh, and for the insecurity into the dietary, uh, the, the newer edition of dietary guidelines. Can you elaborate on that and how that's going to look like? Because as you know, the past dietary guidelines talk about uh, kind of very generically what kind of diet uh, healthy, what kind of diet uh, unhealthy, but how can we um, uh, develop dietary guidelines through the disparity or inequity lens. 
So as I mentioned, there's um, three approaches to examine the evidence, systematic reviews, data analysis, and food pattern modeling. In the systematic review work, uh, the committee is really um, working to identify and speak to what's in the literature around socioeconomic position, around um, different factors, variables that's in that published literature, and so that it's less of a um, really being able to speak to the generalizability of that evidence base to the U.S. population. In data analysis, that's an analysis that looks at federal data sets and really helps us to understand, so as I mentioned, average HEI score is a 58, but there is some variability of that based on um, SNAP participation and different variables. And so they're looking at different variables to really understand how the, what those differences are um, in the population. I think a really exciting uh, space is in our food pattern modeling. So that's where the second slide or so, I showed that pattern of recommended um, you know, food groups and subgroups. And really doing a lot of work to understand different cultural diets and sometimes different staple foods, different staple carbohydrate foods, and then how that might fit. Some people don't as, eat as many whole grains. What if you have starchy vegetables instead of those whole grains? And really understanding those patterns and being more representative of the range, the variety of food that we see consumed in the U.S. And so I think a real emphasis around this is really understanding how generalizability, you know, generalizable the evidence is. And we understand there's a, there's a lot of research recommendations in that space, mm -hmm. but also doing a lot of work to show, have equitable representation. So it doesn't, it's, we've always said it's not one size fits all, but really showing how that um, acts, you know, is in action is a real focus of this committee. Great. Uh, my final question is also for you. So I think we all agree we're living in the uh, obesogenic food environment. <laughs> we are bombarded by all kinds of uh, uh, um, advertisement of unhealthy foods and, and beverages and uh, uh, everywhere you go, uh, uh, highly processed unhealthy foods. And so w the question is what can we do about it? Because people talk about individual responsibility versus social responsibility or corporate responsibility. And we know that uh, our individual behaviors are uh, heavily influenced by our environment, by policies. So I guess my question is uh, to improve uh, our food environment, um, what kind of things uh, you can uh, think of would be, I mean, effective at uh, uh, either uh, individual level or at uh, um, community level or, or population level? Mm -hmm. You want me to take that one? Yeah. <laughs> that, that very easy to answer question. Um, <laughs> Yeah, thank you for that, Dr. Hugh. Um, you know, I think there's a variety of things here, uh, and we can also learn from what other countries have done. I don't study food advertising at all, um, but there certainly are a number of other countries out there who have put in place more strict restrictions around how we advertise, especially to children. That's a pathway, um, mm -hmm. for sure. I mean, I think the first thing that we have to do is recognize that what people eat, as you just did, is deeply affected by their food environment. We are, we are Yes, we make individual decisions, but the capacity for people to make indiv individual decisions about what goes on their plate is highly impacted by their food environment. And some of us have more choice and capacity to influence what's on our plate than others. You know, some of the work that we're looking at in, in northern New England, so uh, a lot of my work is focused in Vermont and Maine, uh, the two most rural states in the United States. So Vermont, 65% of our population lives in a rural place. We are the most rural state in the United States. Rural places face very different challenges in food environment than urban, uh, urban places, for example. Um, so there are some transportation infrastructure in, in particular that I think is really critical, both in urban and rural places um, that are necessary. This, we saw this a lot with COVID, actually. So uh, during COVID, when a lot of grocery stores started doing delivery, for example, well, that was not possible where I live in Vermont. No one's getting grocery delivery in rural Vermont. And so that deeply impacted you know, people who were um, disabled, maybe homebound, unable to get out, they couldn't get to a grocery store, all of these uh, safety 
safety nets around transportation ended. Um, so I think transportation is a critical component regardless of urban or rural places. The other thing that we're focusing on a lot in our research, um, which we haven't talked about at all today, is actually people uh, producing their own food, uh, which uh, we have left out of the conversation. But our research from Vermont and Maine after the pandemic, we first identified in 2020 uh, about a third of our respondents to sort of representative statewide samples were saying they produced their own food or they went hunting or fishing or foraging or gardening. Uh, that continued to increase. Uh, we're now at about 60%. There's been a huge increase during COVID in people suddenly being interested in where their food has come from. Um, and we are also looking at how that is impacting food security mm -hmm. and nutrition outcomes and finding very important evidence to show that households that are engaging in some of these activities actually do have higher fruit and vegetable intake, actually do have more lean, lean meat consumption, for example. Um, but we basically do nothing in the federal government or state government to help people grow their own food, have access to land to hunt or fish, um, including for indigenous um, peoples as well. So I think this is a really important pathway that my lab is really focused on understanding more um, because we have largely left our own food production off off the plate in the conversation, which I realize you know, can be um, challenging for different populations in terms of land access. But I think it is a really important mm -hmm. potential uh, solution to think about as well. Yeah, yeah. thanks. Uh, Bo, uh, just a quick question. How does the food environment look like in Thailand? And has it changed a lot? Because uh, we're running out of time. Can you give a, a quick uh, response? Right. Um, in Thailand, we also have a lot of highly processed food and highly industrialized food. And I oh, sort of looking for the government to put more like law enforcement or legal things onto the food, like all the food additives that should not be used anymore in the food, um, or the trans fat that the Thai government really confusing what is it about and declare zero trans fats mm. country. But when you walk into the modern trade, you still can see like margarines and shortenings and everything. So I really hope that the Thai government or the agency in Thailand, like really looking into this and then make it a law that you can't produce it. As simple as that. Okay, thank you. Uh, you, you have the final words. <laughs> Thank you. No. <laughs> I was just reflecting on, um, you know, what can we do and how do we make that change? Um, you know, we are working on um, some system science work to really understand that larger system and kind of put it on paper mm -hmm. and so we can talk more about what elements um, we need to focus on and which might have the largest impact. Um, our advisory committee is also looking at strategies to help move um, current consumption, essentially to move closer to aligning with the dietary guidelines. So I hope that there's more work in that space as well. Thank you. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much for this really stimulating uh, discussions and uh, thank you. Thank you, Frank, Meredith, Eve, and Bo. And uh, central to preparation and consumption, all of you mentioned food waste. I think reducing food waste would go a long way towards impacting climate change. And one other thing I'd like to uh, mention, and I know I stand between you and lunch, which is what Meredith mentioned about um, radical shifts in diet. And it sort of, re sort of sums up the morning sessions, which is the long game. So this idea of transitioning farms, farming transition, transitioning in farming and diet is not going to happen overnight. So, but it will happen. 